We're in Crystal City, Virginia, across the Potomac River from Washington, D.C. It's a Saturday night, and it's uh, a little after 6.30. We're waiting for Dr. Haider Abdel Shafi, who this evening is going to give a talk about the peace process and about the PLO-Israeli agreement and about what's happening in the Middle East. I suspect uh, most of the viewers of Middle East Realities may not know who Dr. Haider Abdel Shafi is. And yet, just a few years ago, um, he was on international television and was quite famous. He was, in fact, the spokesperson, the main uh, delegate at the Madrid peace talks and subsequently at the Washington peace talks. He was the man chosen by Yasser Arafat to head the Palestinian delegation and to give the key Palestinian talks um, about their cause and about uh, the peace process. The reason uh, that he has not been heard from subsequently in the international media and is no longer uh, the, uh, the head of the uh, peace delegation is because Dr. Shafi decided that he did not approve of the agreements that were made between Yasser Arafat and the Israelis. And in fact, he uh, refused to go to the White House uh, ceremony on September 13th, 1993. And he has refused to go to subsequent uh, ceremonies that have taken place in Cairo and uh, other locations in Gaza and the occupied territories. Dr. Abdul Shafi is a very dignified man, um, a very mild-mannered man, a man of considerable background uh, in these issues, a man who spent all his life actually fighting for Palestinian statehood. And the very fact that he refused to endorse the agreement, refused to go to the White House ceremony, and has taken an opposition position, even though it isn't uh, well known, even though this event is not well covered, even though we, Middle East Realities, are the only uh, TV crew here this evening, um, nevertheless, uh, what he has to say is extremely important and very much representative of what a lot of intellectuals and a lot of activists think, which is, uh, if I can summarize it in advance of his talk, that the agreement Yasser Arafat made was little more than a camouflaged surrender and it was not what uh, the Palestine peace delegation had expected, it was not what they had been instructed, and it was not something that uh, Dr. Abdul Shafi was willing to personally endorse. This evening there's a room full of people, maybe 40 or 50 people. Um, most of these people are involved with the Palestine Aid Society in one way or another which is a small organization that has chapters around the country that raises, I believe, a few hundred thousand dollars a year that is sent back to various institutions in the occupied territories. And hopefully, in just a few minutes, uh, this event will begin. It's not untypical that uh, events sponsored by Arab organizations with Arab speakers start a half hour, 45 minutes, or an hour late. Fortunately, we're not live. Today, I'd, like to introduce, today, I'd like to introduce to you Dr. George Zahir, who is the National President of Palestine Aid Society, who would like to just make some welcoming remarks. Good evening again, and thank you very much for joining us. I see that there are a lot of new faces here, and it's great for Palestine Aid Society to have all these new faces coming in, I'm sure. The presence of Dr. Abdi Shafi had to do a lot with it, but we are also proud to see you coming here to our activities. As you see on your way in, uh, we have our newsletter, and uh, we have membership involved, and we'd like you to take some of those out with you, give them uh, to your friends, and if you have to follow one, please do one for yourself. Uh, as you all know, Palestinian society uh, has been active in the American scene for more than 15 years. We do work with Palestinian refugees in Lebanon and with Palestinians in the occupied territories in the West Bank and Gaza, and we're proud of our work. We're, uh, we're very, very proud to be the only Palestinian organization that has a mass base in the U.S. that managed to survive through all of these crises that we're going through. And we're also very proud to be one of the very, very few Arab organizations in the United States that are funded by its membership here, and we even have some access to send overseas. So we're going to need your support, and thank you very much for being here. Thank you, George. Uh, I now would like to introduce to you Dr. Haider Abdel Shafi, 
Uh, most of you, of course, yes. know who he is, so I won't uh, do a lengthy introduction. Uh, Dr. Abdel Shafi is most known, I guess, recently as the former head of the uh, delegation to the Middle East Peace Talks. He has been active for more than, uh, what, 50, 60 years <laughs> on the scene for the cause of uh, freedom and justice for the Palestinian people. He's one of the founders of the Palestine Liberation Organization, and uh, I can go on and on, so I'll just get right to it. Please welcome Dr. Haider Abdel Shafi. that 
there is no military solution. And that all this struggle and bloodshed is leading to nothing. There is no military solution for the problem. And so the Palestinians realistically um, adopted a peace initiative in 1988, November 1988, that in essence accepted the principle of the two-state solution as a basis for negotiations to reach an agreement and reach a solid peace with the Israelis. As you know, Israel rejected this peace initiative offhand. And the United States government, the principal party that has the say in what goes on in the area, chose to evade this as being insufficient or something. I don't know what, what that meant, but I think it was another way of accommodating Israel. So why we hope that this, and we were advised, as a matter of fact, by friends in Europe and in America, only if we accept the right of Israel to exist, then peace is going to, to come and there will be an end to the strife and to the difficulties. Nothing of this sort happened. So uh, it was until the Gulf crisis and the intervention of the United States, the, of the uh, European powers and all the, all the world to resolve the issue of the Gulf, and it proved to be not only a matter of uh, forcing Iraq out of Kuwait, but destroying Iraq itself in the most brutal manner. However, it was conducted under the banner of Security Council resolutions. And you remember that at that time, uh, Saddam, one of his ideas was to make a link between the occupation of Kuwait and the occupation of Palestinian territory and that he is ready to withdraw from Kuwait if Israel withdraws from the occupied territories. I think that was logical and reasonable, something to, to be said, given by Sudan. But uh, it was rejected on the pretext that this is going to be rewarding Saddam. Now, I don't understand what does it mean rewarding, but anyhow, the American government did not accept this, but they were embarrassed to promise in the summit that took place in Helsinki between Gorbachev and, uh, and Bush to say that they will attend to the problem of peace in the East immediately after they settled the issue in the, in the Gulf. So really we became a little hope. And when the issue, indeed, I mean, uh, when the uh, Gulf issue was settled, the United States started, started its movement to uh, resolve the Israeli-Palestinian issue. <coughs> when Mr. Baker came first to the area and uh, promoting the peace process, I had only one, I happened to be a man who met him, and I had only one question in my mind to ask Baker and whether he thinks that the continued settlement process by the Israelis is compatible with the prospects of peace. And uh, Baker's answer was, affirming that they are not contented. And when I asked him, does that mean that the United States is going to prevail on Israel to stop the settlement process? He said, well, I really don't think that the Congress is going to take such a resolution. So when I further said, what are we talking about then? He said, well, the peace process will generate its own momentum and things will move. The only thing that we have to sit on the negotiation. I, I had not the chance to carry further this, this argument to him because I didn't understand what he meant, but I assume that what he meant is that uh, because the United States is going to be the main sponsor for the peace process, that it is going to be an active part and see that things will move this way. But we, our hopes were frustrated because it did not move this way. The first year of negotiation, which was during the Bush administration, we were hoping, and because Baker admitted that there is a contradiction between the continuous settlement process and the prospects of peace, our hopes were that the American government would be about to see that such a contradiction should be uh, obviated, but nothing happened. As a matter of fact, the Bush administration took a 
very special tragedy. They did not want to interfere at all. We complained about the Israeli position. The Israeli position continued to stem from their old claim to, to the Palestinian territory. Now, this is a matter that is often uh, missed or uh, not taken into view by people who follow the peace process. But this is the gist of the problem. That the old claim that started in the first Zionist Congress in, 19, in 1897, claiming all the Palestinian territory, continued, is maintained, it actually is maintained till this moment as we are here speaking. So the fact that Israel refused, rejected the peace initiative by the Palestinians in November 1988, <coughs> we may nobody care to think why did they reject this. After all, it was a far-reaching conciliation on the part of the Palestinians. It was a 180 degrees change in the attitude of the Palestinians. Before that, we were calling for one single democratic secular state and all of Palestine where Jews and Arabs could live together in equity and in democracy. It was a fair, it was a fair thing on our part, but Israel rejected this consistently. And so we finally had to listen to the advice of friends here and there, and we said, okay, we accept the principle of but Israel rejected this. Why did Israel reject it? Of course, it is obvious now, I tell you, because it has been maintaining its own illegal claim to all the Palestinian territory. Very, very simple. <coughs> now, and that really was the cause of the impasse in the negotiation that took place, started in Madrid and continued in Washington. I was very uh, engaged in this, in this peace process, as you know. And as I said often to uh, journalists and mm -hmm. press conferences, the impasse, which we were questioned about very much, stemmed from the fact that Israel did not drop its claim. And so <coughs> it considered what it has established in the occupied territories illegally and against condemnation of the Security Council and world opinion, I mean the settlements and settlers, as being illegal and as being obstructive to peace. But Israel, of course, never heeded this and continued. All this only affirms that Israel continued to claim the Palestinian, Palestinian territory. And so actually, the Israel's attitude in the negotiations was that it wanted to leg legitimize what it had established illegitimately and illegally in the occupied territories. That was the cause of the, of the impasse. And really, personally, I started calling for suspending the negotiations there was no sense in continuing this negotiation day in and day out with an impasse going on. I was calling for suspending the negotiations and that the Palestinians should review the situation and decide what to do and where to go. While we were in this, we, the uh, agreement of Oslo was declared. Now I of course, we didn't know anything. I personally didn't know anything about this in the negotiating delegation. We didn't know that we were not party to this. And I would have been very happy had this agreement been a satisfactory and an agreement that promises to establish a fair and just peace in the area. I said my opinion about this. The agreement. Uh, uh, Immediately, and I criticized the agreement as <coughs> having many failures, and that, in my opinion, it was very doubtful that it is going to be, it's going to realize the just and 
European peace that everybody was looking forward to. However, I didn't engage in any activity to, to, to uh, destroy the agreement, to this or that, uh, because I certainly didn't, didn't have an alternative to offer the place of the agreement. And I thought the alternative could only be decided on by the United Palestinian position. So I thought under the circumstances, it's only that I voiced my opinion, and that should be enough. Now, why is this agreement not successful? Because it did not address the main issue that was the source of the impasse in the Washington negotiation. The Israeli insistence on continuing with the settlement process and refusing to concede that the, the interim, the Palestinian interim self-government should have jurisdiction over all the occupied territories, as indeed it should, according to the terms of reference, Resolution 242, and according to the understanding of the peace process. Also, one of the main principles, one of the main understandings of the peace process that nothing should be no activity should be, should go on the ground that could prejudice the outcome of the second state negotiation. And so it was very clear that the Israeli continued establishment of settlement is, is the matter that is going to prejudice the outcome of the second state negotiation more than anything else. Things were very, uh, very clear. So the Oslo agreement did not address this issue. Another matter is that the Oslo Agreement didn't say anything about the Palestinian right to self-determination. Now, we are not going to this uh, peace process to, to uh, just uh, uh, dissipate time. We are going to see that our basic and Indian rights are realized. And we insist, and we say openly, that no peace can be established except on the basis of the Indian government should respond to the basic rights of the Palestinians as well as to the rights of the Israelis. We have already uh, given our portion of what reconciliation is needed by recognizing the right of Israel to exist, but Israel, even in this mutual recognition between Arafat and Rabin, which is a very asymmetric recognition, but we recognize Israel as a state, as an independent state, and all this, the Israeli recognition is simply that the PLO is the legitimate leadership of the Palestinian people. Nothing to say about the right of the Palestinians to self-determination and their own independent state. And of course, there are other Failures and uh, ambiguities, and leaving so many things open to different interpretations that this gave Israel the upper hand in the subsequent negotiation, the Cairo Agreement, and all this. With the Cairo Agreement, of course, is seen as much worse than the Oslo Agreement itself, because Israel imposed its own opinion on how things sh should be, whether control of the crossings or the withdrawal issue or whatever is there. So this is the situation that uh, now <coughs> let me just here say because I know that Palestinians everywhere are in a state of uh, not knowing what to do, what to accept, what to accept, what is, what is to be done, what is the next. 